Hello and welcome to BCM 300 Game Experience Design. Today we're talking about the relationship between mechanics and narratives or stories and rules and I am once again joined by the game designer Richard Hall. Say hello Richard. Hello. How you doing? I'm doing great. We're going to use all sorts of fun words in this one like diegesis. <laughs> right yes um so I'm, I'm just switching over to the to the the prezi and um talking about the the partnership of game mechanics and game narratives so in the two previous lectures we took a deep dive into game mechanics and and we took a a, a good look at game themes and particularly when we were talking about themes, you'll notice in that discussion, we kept talking about mechanics. And often when you're talking about mechanics, particularly at the design stage, you're often thinking about how the mechanics are related to the theme, even if it's an abstract game. And so when you're thinking about creating a game experience, and this is particularly useful for your group game pitch, and your individual game design that you need to think of these two as um, two parts of a whole very much uh, synthesis yeah the we we mentioned in the first uh week of lectures that there is a lot of stuff here which is about choosing competing models we're going to talk a lot about uh games and stories and mechanics and, and the interplay of those things but understand when we talk about this, we are talking about this as, as a approach to starting to make games. This isn't some grand truth that like, oh no, all games work this way or all games work that way. It's a model for looking at how games work. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's a model that we do share with others in the industry, but certainly yep. there are people that go, no, 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 no. We, if we're talking about games, you've got to focus on the mechanic. The mechanic is the thing about the game. And the story, yeah, and, the story and, is just the fluff on top. In fact, in some game cultures the story is called fluff yeah uh i'm on the i'm on the first slide and i've got um i've got monopoly up on screen because why not have a whipping boy <laughs> games as a form of media and communication are an effective way of transmitting ideas stories philosophies and ideologies but this is the concept of the game as a philosophy engine and the story and the theme, mechanics and the rules are the components and the parts of that engine. So Richard, what is, what is the philosophy? What is the ideology of Monopoly? Okay, so we talk, uh, sometimes you'll hear me use the phrase base assumptions when I talk about games. Like what's the stuff that this game needs to be true for it to make sense? In Monopoly, one of the basic assumptions of that game is that acquisition is good and capitalism is good. These, this is just how this game works. You win by becoming good at capitalism, and the winner does the best capitalism at one another. Now, I'm not trying to get like super pinko about you know what it should be saying, but it is very clear that in Monopoly, money is good. Money inherently arrives in your life regardless of the labor you put in. You are involved in property trading and being a landlord which is seen as just an acceptable uh, uh promotion you know way for money to arrive in your life right? also one of so i mean that's 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 particularly a, an emphasis on the kind of thematic elements of monopoly what what the game is communicating by its mechanics for example is that uh, you can actually lose the game. So not only not win, like most games, you know, there is a winner um, and then there are people who don't quite win. In Monopoly, you can actually be ejected from the game by not having enough money. Mm. So, so this, is a, this is an ideology about capitalism and about failing in capitalism that is built into the mechanics of the game at a fundamental level uh it's it's very it's very depressing and we can talk about uh uh winners losers and how those work uh because there's a whole wing of interesting different ways to to approach that but the basics for now very much you know just the idea of 
uh, of Monopoly has knockouts based on how much money you have, literally tying your ability to make money to your ability to continue to exist. So I've just brought up Pandemic uh, on the screen and mm -hmm. Pandemic is a really interesting philosophy engine because it's, it's message, right? What it is mediating and what it is communicating is a model of how infections work and how they spread rapidly across the globe. It's a model for communicating the idea that when we're fighting a global pandemic, we are all in this together. There are no winners and losers apart from the whole group who's playing the game. So you are collectively working together to cure all of these pandemics that are breaking out across the, across the world. And you either win together or you lose together. And that is communicating an ideology, a philosophy about cooperation and collaboration. Especially in times of global crisis. Uh, yeah. No, no, and and this, this, by the way, comes through, and this is one of the things you got to find when we talk about the theme. This comes through in so much of the elements of Pandemic. Just look on the cover. The cover of Pandemic features an Asian woman wearing a, uh, a lab coat. And like the, the, the vision of the person who solves things in games um, was not always... Hang on a second. Oh, God, no, I'm remembering a different cover. That's all right. I was just yeah, looking at the no, cover. Completely, it's a different cover. I know the I cover that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a different, there's a different, there's a pandemic expansion that has a, uh, has an Asian scientist on the cover. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the laboratory uh, expansion. Yeah, yeah. But your point, your point still holds. Yeah. Like the, the, the vision of everyone coming together and working together on pandemics uh, default cover, the one we're showing here, does show people from many different walks of life. Absolutely. So this is just a kind of top domain primer about the types of stories that games can communicate through the mediation of different themes and rules working together to tell a story. So let's, let's move on. One of the most common ways to start making games is to focus on one of two things. I want to make a game about uh, princess dragons collecting Easter eggs, right? That's, that's a kind of story. Like that's a theme, really. Okay, I mentioned collecting. So mechanics are kind of in there embedded in it. But, that's, but the thing was really about the, the world. But another way to focus is to go, I have this awesome idea about moving uh, meeples with random um, uh, rangers pulled out of a bag, right? And that's a focus on a, a mechanic that you think is going to be fun that you can then find a story to go with. The uh, first week I gave, sorry, the second week I gave a, uh, a summary of the discussion by Rainer Knizia, the uh, extremely prolific developer, where he said at the time, that when you're developing games, you start from one of three points. You start with a narrative, a mechanic, or a component. We are putting components to the side for now. We're just going to look at the idea of creating games based off a narrative or creating games based off a mechanic. And mechanics can get very, very fine as places to start. It's an interesting point. I, I often enroll mechanics and components together. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe... It's maybe. Maybe we sh yeah I think I think for ease we'll keep them together. But I like that that idea that there's actually three parts because that gives you a, a triangular structure to think about. We may have to revisit that in in future. Okay, game design tip. Now, I've seen Richard do this, and I think I I added this slide because I I think I saw you doing this, and that is if you are designing a game for your individual project. Uh, or for your group project, it would be excellent to have a notebook or a Word document or even a series of blog posts where you just jot down ideas and thoughts about your stories and your mechanics. Um, maybe you're working on a, a story and you come up with a mechanic and it doesn't quite fit, but you can detail that in your journal and you can come back to it later. 
I'm I do this extensively. I have literally a shelf of notebooks at this point where it's just I have an idea, I explore it, I write it down, and sometimes those ideas get made and sometimes they don't, uh, and sometimes they get revisited. Um, it, it it is a I, I refer to it as having a library of of ideas and mechanics that you've looked at and explored. So you know, pulling apart a game that already exists, for example, just to go, well, what makes this work? That's really interesting, and that you know, that would make a great digital artifact. Absolutely, this is this is the kind of thing that should be in your dossier, even if you do not take up that that mechanic or that theme as part of your game. Uh, an, uh, an appendix in the dossier that you submit in, in week 13 or just a photo from that journal or an excerpt from that journal and maybe just a few notes about why you didn't include it, why it didn't quite work or where it might go in the future. That's the kind of evidence that we're looking for in, in yeah. the dossier. We we love actionable data. <laughs> we are dorks. <laughs> so... One way you can start to make a game is by focusing on the mechanic. Another way you can start is by, um, uh, you know, having your mechanics, locking that down, figuring out what you'll find fun, and then just finding a story to fit around that. Another way to go about it is to um, have a, a theme that you, that you want to, to deal with. I've got terraforming Mars there. But this might be. If you're, if you're making an educational game for, for young children, this might be about a theme of, um, I, had, I had an example of dinosaurs there, but I just thought of dinosaurs going to the dentist. Right. Right. That's a lovely, you know, kind of theme that you could make for say five, uh, four to six year olds. See, and this right here is the kind of practice that as you go, as you do more of this, this will get easier when you start considering these things in terms of systems. Because you said dinosaurs going to the dentist, I immediately have three different <laughs> ideas for what they could be. And one of them is child centric. But here's the other one what if it's a card game where you're taking your dinosaur to the dentist and you need to keep them calm because they're worried? Yeah. And it's a game of exchanging resources between uh, the anxiety and the, uh, versus the importance of learning a lesson. I immediately thought of a drafting game where the, yep. de the deck of cards is just cards with different types of cavities. Mm. And, and so you, you draw five and you take the one with the smallest cavity and pass it on. And so, you know, the winner, you know, it, it arrives with, with, at the dentist with the mouthful of the least cavities and the, 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 the one who doesn't win is the, is the one who has, needs the most fillings. And by the way, that there, your description included another type of mechanic here that get that, that like you know sometimes gets lost you in, in your drafting game that isn't actually picking a winner that's picking a loser yeah because what you're doing is you are trying to make sure that the next player has worse options than you and you are consistently trying to make sure that the other players lose rather than do anything that makes you win and i'm gonna go and write that down in a minute yeah <laughs> okay uh, in the next couple of slides, I've got um, some excerpts from a lovely essay uh, by Jeremy Holcomb called um, Story or Mechanics. And this is from a book called The White Box Essays. It was a Kickstarter project uh, that was short essays done by game designers. Um, okay, so let me read this out. Regardless of how you start, you should strive to get past the idea that story and mechanics can be developed separately sooner rather than later. Your mechanics should feel like your story and your story should help teach your mechanics. Treating story and mechanics as if they are somehow distinct and unrelated parts of your design that can be modified or swapped independently of each other is missing the point if you want to create games. What do you think about that, Richard? I think it's very true. I think that this is a, uh, a fantastic uh, first pitfall. Um, we mentioned Rainer Knizia, enormously prolific bank monster that he is. <laughs> um, his, he is a systems guy. He develops systems almost exclusively. And it means that a number of his games, the fiction is very much meaningless, and it's very hard to remember how to play them. Uh, Matt Cavotta, writing for Magic the Gathering, did an extensive article called The Flavor's the Thing, 
which was about the way that the flavor of Magic the Gathering being about battles between wizards and you know, summoning dragons and whatnot makes that game so much more passable by a human brain that if you break it down to just its digit into just its uh, uh, numerical uh, and spatial components, it is fantastically difficult to manage. And uh, yeah, you you need to keep, you need to build these things together. You can't build them in different rooms and then just like stick them together. Absolutely spot on. And um, I remember uh, you didn't I just was... get me on this call to agree with him, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was just thinking as you were talking, um, I had a lot of trouble uh, learning uh, the rules for the game Root. Um, yes, but it's a but it's a story. It's a story about woodland creatures going to war for territory, and as mm -hmm. as we got into it further, the the story of the play really became cemented in my mind. And I found that as I got the story of the battles and the and the types of personalities of the different of like the mice versus the cats versus the fox versus the birds, the the rules gelled for me. In, yes, in a much stronger way. And so I just I. I just think you were, you were spot on there. In the case of Root, there's a mechanic, uh, and I apologize if I'm in the weeds here, uh, but in, in Root, there is a mechanic where one of the cultures, um, e e what, what's happening there mechanically is they are getting a steadily increasing complexity of turns based on every decision you made in previous turns. And mechanistically speaking, this is nightmarish to manage. This is a fantastically difficult thing to grapple with mentally. And the whole point of the way Root handles it is it frames it as you are a posh bunch of aristocrats dealing with uh, a rule that is just part of the aristocracy you live in. And so it makes that whole thing manageable. Fiction is a way that we stick our minds to ideas because and we're going to talk about storytelling and learning things. If you want an example of where this falls apart for any of you who are video game players, uh, pretty much every video game that a woman named Rhiannon Pratchett has worked on uh, she was responsible for one of the first uh, Tomb Raider reboots and for the video game Mirror's Edge. She wrote interesting, sophisticated, complicated scripts that were off on her own without being integrated into the game mechanics. And that means that the games that she's worked on, quite good games in general, but the story is always quite mangled because the story was made to serve an existing mechanism rather than to try and uh come together with that mechanism that's a that's a good segue to the next slide because I'll, I'll read this quote out and then i'll explain the real fight between story and mechanics doesn't come at the initial concept stage it comes during the development if your design starts to break down when you discover parts of your game that don't work and you need to make changes you'll have to decide which is more important the story you've been telling or the mechanics of play and that example that you were making there is 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 that um that sacrifice that you have to make sometimes where you have to take away a mechanic because it's not contributing to the story of the game or you have to adjust your story of the game in order to um include a, a mechanic that you really want to focus on for the experience hmm. and and this is this is hard oh yeah I, uh... this is not easy stuff this is why um, the notebooks, by the way, because I've had no numerous times where I've had a mechanic, I've really liked it, and then after playtesting, I realized this mechanic does not belong here, I have to get rid of it, it has to go, and so you put it in a box, like a butterfly pressed in an old book, <laughs> you, hope you find the home for it later. Really morbid, I guess, only, I guess not a lot of people's mums pressed butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the, one of the exceptions of the rule usually is the notion of abstract games. And a lot of people say that abstract games don't really have story. And I disagree with that. With an abstract game, the story is the event. The story is emergent, right? It's, 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 it may be not a, a, you know, a beautifully epic poem, but it's still the story of your play and the person you're playing with and the events that are unfolding. And so I actually think that there is a deep connection between abstract games and role-playing games. Yes. Role-playing games are all about the story that, that the, the players are telling. 
And the mechanics are secondary to that. And I think abstract games are the inverse, where it's all about the mechanics and the story that's being told by those mechanics. So I think there's a, a deep connection. And, and we've talked about, you know, Paytas and Ludus. And I, I, I think, you know, these, these two games exist on the same, ex, same spectrum when we're dealing with mechanics and story. And they're connected, but they are very far apart. Am I crazy? Like, yeah, like, you know, you know, my, and I, I've, I've argued this, and I'm going to say this in front of students a lot. Um, a, a game is a machine that makes a story. And that means that uh, the, the byproduct of uh, this, this vision of the board game, and, sorry, the, the um, abstract game and the role-playing game as being effectively cousins in the same way is very much true. They are both absolutely putting one element or the other in the foreground and that's pretty much spot on all right i like this quote think of theme and mechanics as tools in your toolbox no one tool solves every problem and you should use both when they work for you start wherever you like but get your story Mechanics feeding into each other as quickly as you can. And this is why roll and move games tend to be quite boring because it's um, mm. a kind of foregone conclusion. It's just a, it's just a, uh, you know, a race, the end. So to talk about like a flaw in that when it comes to a roll and move, um, I just, I would, uh, you know, speculative question here. Hey, um, in Monopoly, why is your movement random? Uh, so that's a mechanic yep. that, that is attempting to replicate the system of uh, uh, debt and income that, that we experience under capitalism with the randomization of events in everyday life. Right. So it's random because it's random. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Like, That's the story. The story of that is that that mechanic is that life is random. Yeah. But, but that, but the uh, movement around the board representing your opportunity to go to thing, go, go to various properties and buy them. When you land on a board square, you are, you have to pay rent while you're there indicating that you are literally staying there, that there is a material presence of a character moving around this board. In which case the question then becomes, why is my movement along that, you know, random? What is making my movement so wildly just different from time to time? Now, if instead this game was about junky cars, for example, being like uh, out, outback, outback repair people. Yeah. You know, the car breaks down and we need to stick a tree in, in the <laughs> engine to make it work. If it was that kind of thing, suddenly the rolling, the unreliable stop and start nature of the car has a mechanical connection. When you have a roll and move that's trying to represent an actual race, like everyone is going as fast as possible, it suddenly makes a lot less sense because why I, why is there this variance when you showed up to race? Uh, I like the, the the car analogy because it, it it refers to that kind of toolkit again. You know yeah. what 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 is in your toolkit that you can draw on to to make things work. And and there is a game uh, um, called Formula D, which yes. actually works with this, where uh, the the dice represents the gear you're in. So you start rolling a D6, and when you gear up, you roll a D10, and then when you gear up again, you eventually get to the point where you're rolling a D30. And it's not as simple a variance as 1 to 30 on the D30. It's, it's like 10 to 30. Uh, um, because you know, it uses the larger variance to represent the, the greater capacity to get uh, extra distance, but the minimums also go up because you are getting faster. And... Just to kind of summarize this, this section is this, this quote that I really like from, from Holcomb is that is the story of your game should help teach your rules and the mechanics should work to enhance your story. So, you know, just, just keep that phrase in mind as you go through your design. So that brings us to another essay that I really like in the white box collection. Mm -hmm. And that is this article by Jeff uh, Tidball called Pacing Gameplay, the three-act structure, just like God and Aristotle intended. 
And <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really like this article. I like Aristotle's model of narrative in poetics. I'm not going to read it out because it's, um, it, it, it's on screen. You can, you can check out that quote. Um, Basically, the Greek philosopher Aristotle, in his treatise called Poetics, set out how a dramatic structure should be constructed and how it can be understood in terms of a whole, so the, 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 the drama as a whole. And in order for a drama to be whole, it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And Tidbull adapts this for thinking about the experience of tabletop games, whether, whether it's an abstract game, a role-playing game, or, or a, a, a big box game, a, a Meritrash or Euro game, or just a card game, whatever. In order for it to be dramatic, it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so um, I'm just gonna sc scroll down into this, um, section on human minds. So this is very much connected to the deep structures of the human brain. The, the human brain has evolved as a very complex pattern recognition system. And we recognize the, the, the way in which stories function as philosophy engines to teach us about things through the patterns of that beginning, middle, and end. Now there are there are you know in in literary theory, in you know creative writing theory, there are much more there are much more in depth models and, and much bigger takes on this. This is just a super broad strokes mm -hmm. about poetics. Um, you know, a, a kind of a, a neat packaging. Yeah, as with all these things, if you go out and do your own reading and you bring us information and show that you've been doing reading that we did not immediately mention, that will play in your favor. So if you find this interesting, go check it out. Yeah. Especially if you're interested in trying to make games that tell stories with like specific controlled narratives that you want to make. But in your dossier for your independent game design, you should definitely uh, you know, provide an overview of the game, provide a copy of the game rules, and then a description of the game that involves talking about how it begins, how the middle play section occurs, or act two, as we'll talk about, and how the game concludes. So, and you know, you only need a paragraph each of those sections, and that's a good way of communicating your ideas. And okay. what it's worth, don't think you need to get this perfect either. Um, one of, Scrabble has a stunningly boring ending. I oh, don't yeah. know if you've ever watched high level competitive Scrabble. Yeah. They actually get to a point where players, like two or three words from the end, just stop because they have at the point where they can recognize, oh, the point gap is this big. There's no words I can possibly make that will do this. So now we do a little bit of bookkeeping to track who actually won and the game is concluded. Good day, sir. Like it's, it is entirely reasonable for a game to have a weak ending especially uh especially if that's not where you're engaging but just being able to recognize and tell us here is how my game works and here is how my game ends is meaningful yeah yeah we'll, we'll definitely talk about that so what i want to do now is to um oops sorry my prezi is going uh oh, is, to, is to talk a little bit more in detail um in this section of the lecture about the, the first act, the second act, and the third act uh, of your game. So in the beginning, <laughs> beginnings are important, right? Beginnings are super important if your beginning isn't fun. Like even the way you set up the game, like mm. if, if, if it's so complicated that, that it, it takes hours to set up, you really like there has to be such a big payoff for that like the middle act has to be amazing um beginnings set the stage they introduce the characters they explain the world of experience they open up the the world and establish the rules and the the dramatic question right is is that at the beginning as you as your players are commencing in their mind should be this question of who will win. If you can tell 
who's going to win from the beginning, you need to rethink your game design. Um, the first act is often called the call to action. Um, and this sets up the following acts. And it usually, the first act usually ends with the players deciding on a strategy. Now that's not always the case. Some players just don't decide on a strategy. There are plenty of games that I just sit down and play with my friends not to win. Like I, I deliberately choose not to win because I am just there to have a fun time with my, my friends or my family, right? I have kids, you know, I can't sit there and go, all right, I know how to win. Sometimes I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but some, but you know, the majority of the times I'm, I'm just here for the experience. So this phrase, the call to action, again, for any of you uh, doing creative writing or, or literary stuff, this is very important because this is like, st like Chris refers to it as the point where they uh, decide on a strategy. But the thing is, it is about the point, you, you know, you've done the beginning when players are aware of what they can do. This is going to be important, especially if you do teaching or learning games. If you say, okay, hey, players, uh, you can do A, B, C, D, and E in this game. And then midway through the game, you're like, oh, also you can do F. That yeah. feels unfair and it feels really bad. That is exactly right there, the call to action being expressed. That is players grasping the ideas of what this game is for, how this game works, and then you yanking it out from underneath them. So when you want to frame your beginning of the game, try to make sure everything that you need them to know gets introduced in the beginning of the game. This brings us back to back around to the to the first part of the lecture, which is where story and mechanics are inseparable and, and Sidball writes. The first act ends when it becomes clear to savvy players that the boundaries of the conflict have been pretty well established. And when they therefore get a concrete grasp on what they'll be trying to accomplish for the main portion of the game's remaining length. The victory conditions have moved beyond the way the rulebook has expressed them to instead relate to each player's specific plan, victory. So this is the taking the, the kind of general uh, generalization of the rules about how to win and that becoming internalized in the player as, oh, I know what I'm doing now. I'm set up. I can play this game. And that's when mm -hmm. the first act ends. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, ideally, the first act helps new players understand how the rules of the games work. So they can ac approach the second act with confidence that they're on an even footing with other players, at least in their mechanical understanding of the play. Games where understanding key rules takes longer are essentially punishing to pick up. Now, I, 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 I wanted to put this up there because I'm, I'm not entirely uh, in agreeing with this. Because often the first time you play a game, you're just running through the motions. Like you're just trying to understand the rules. Mm. And it's not until the second or third or even fourth time that the, 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 the player understands the harmony between the mechanics and the story. So what you're describing here is a return to that concept we brought up last time of mastery depth. Yeah. There are games, uh, for example, Rhino Hero. Rhino Hero, which I know we've had some students play, is a game where you will learn how to play that game and around the second or third turn, you grasp how to, how to play the game well and you have achieved a degree of mastery. For other much more complicated big box games, and indeed, I'd kind of argue it's almost the, the, the defining element of those big box games that we, that we love, is the first game is learning to play the game and the second play is the first play i play tabletop war games and <laughs> this is a an, an area where i've played uh, you know in the last year probably 10 15 games maybe a bit more mm -hmm. and i am still trying to learn the basic rules uh sheets yeah, I, I, I play Magic the Gathering. Mm. Magic the Gathering has a programmatic rule book. You can build computers, like functional <laughs> computers with cardboard in Magic the Gathering. Um, 
the, and you know the first game of magic the gathering you're just learning the rules the it's like you know your 10th when you're building your own decks and you know you've got a handle on how the game works that you start to really get uh in the level of play where you're engaging with it that way the, I, I want to read out this this quote because this is an important one. No player should feel like they are or should actually be eliminated from consideration for victory in the game's first act. A game where something can go so drastically wrong for anyone in the first act is deeply flawed. Mm. I'm not sure this is true of games like Magic and 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 Pokemon and 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 other collectible card games because. But maybe maybe it is. But this is definitely true of big box board games. Uh, and Dune is a famous example where uh, one player uh, could be eliminated in the first turn. <laughs> the revised version of that game doesn't have that bug, uh, but yeah. it was considered to be the greatest worst game uh, for many years. All right. That brings us to actually my favorite part of a board game, of a tabletop game experience. And that is the second act. For me, this is where it's all at. Like, uh, you know, the first act is set up. That can be exciting. Um, and the third act is conclusion. And that can be cathartic. But it's in the drama of the second act where, where I really enjoy playing games. Um, I like this idea. The second act begins as soon as the flow of play is established. And this is, this is, this is where you can watch students in the classroom when they're playing big box games, when, they, when they've learned the rules and suddenly everyone's invested in the game and they're making decisions. They're, they're um, uh, experiencing the twists and turns and the happenings of the game. And it's really exciting to watch. The second act is where most of the action occurs as players deploy tactics in order to achieve the strategy determined in the first act. Um, so this is where the, the play of the planning starts to happen. And it's super exciting. Good games require the players to view the initial rules differently, to change the way they play in order to get to the finishing line. The second act should provide the core puzzle that the players have to overcome. Now, this is this is the this is a really good point, right? Because the puzzle isn't the rules in and of themselves. The puzzle of the second act is how the players have embodied the story and the mechanics in order to create the setting of the play for that particular game, and that is the puzzle. Sorry, you can tell I, I, I like this bit uh let's move on then as, as it turns out do you know uh you know a game that has a really excellent second act uh oh, i know a couple what what are you thinking i'm thinking splendor oh yes absolutely <laughs> Splendor's a great one uh terraforming mars is a great second act uh wingspan is a great second act concordia oh the 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 second act of concordia is magic Everyone, mm. everyone's kind of committed to their strategies and everyone's like trying to play the best they can in order to get the best uh, resolution. Century Golem has an amazing second act. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T tabletop, Lots of favorite games. Tabletop war games have, have great second acts because um, that's where all the fun happens. Uh, I like this quote. Players may be horribly, terribly tempted to do other things, either by devious mechanics or by the clever strategy of other players. But the battle lines have been drawn. The players will have the most fun pressing the battle rather than meandering confusedly from game mechanic to game mechanic. So this is what I talk about the first game that you play of anything is, is, is the first pancake. Whenever you play the first game for the first time, if you know how to play that game and you've played it before, you should let someone else win. I tell my kids this all the time. If you're introducing someone to a game, always let them win. Because that creates a good association of feeling that the, the, the journey of having to, to work out that game and figure out that game has been worthwhile and that they are armed with a victory so that going into the second and third game, they can play with confidence. And it's just a nice thing to do. In good games, the players will directly oppose each other in their second act struggles. 
Cooperative mm-hmm. games seem like the exception, but they aren't. They simply require the understanding that the players constitute a block allied together on a one side of a battle line drawn against the game itself. Did you want to comment on that one? It's, it's one of those, it's, it's a garden path statement. It wants to lead you along and then go, but I thought of the thing you're about to say already. Which, yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> my, my gut reaction is in, a good, in good games, the players will directly oppose each other in their second act struggles. It's specifically the term good games. Like, that's always like, oh, that's so hard to define and talk about. So I'm just going to grumble about it a bit. <laughs> uh, I, I totally understand, uh, uh, understand what you're saying. Um... There is a whole family of Euro games where the players could be locked in separate rooms and the players who love those games love those games for that. So there are, there are two loaded terms in that. And the first one is good and the second one is directly oppose. Mm. And I don't think it's necessarily presupposing direct competition. I, I, I think that even in a Euro game where you are trying to play the best version of the game that you can play and play your best game, I still think you are in opposition to the types of decisions that other people are playing. And I I take what you, I take your point about being able to play a game in different rooms, but I, I disagree. I think most Euro games, um, the decisions that you make are often, uh, infected. No, that's, that's the wrong word. Um, are often, resonating with the decisions that other people are making uh i was i was going to use a term reiner knizzi has used which is corrupted oh yes his, his vision is that my strategy gets corrupted by your behavior even if we're cooperating and so i think that's the second act right that that, yeah. that corruption is you, you've, mm-hmm. you've decided on your your strategy you're enacting it but they're they're doing something else and yeah. they're making decisions and that's corrupting the way I am making decisions. Yeah. So I, um, but, but I, I agree with you, though, about the good. <laughs> yeah. I would also say that there are a whole range of games, that, that idea of, I mentioned earlier, picking a loser. There's also racing games where effectively we are both trying to get to a goal first. There are a whole range of racing games where we do not interact or directly oppose each other. And effectively, we are playing simultaneous games alongside one another. Uh, and this is actually one of the things about Sorry, the, uh, mm-hmm. the little problematic game that made it interesting in that it was a race game where you did interact. I think that connects to the next, the next quote then. Um, in the very best games, there will be many opportunities for different players to trade what looks to all of them like the leading position. Mm. A game that at any point looks like a foregone conclusion isn't fun. All players should want an exciting game as well as to want to win. And that excitement arises primarily from not knowing whether you're going to win. Uh, Some interesting loaded terms in this quote. Um, Exciting versus competitive. Um should want you know players should want i'm not sure you should be dictating what players should want but mm-hmm. the, the, fun the, is yeah such a low term. <laughs> but the core idea here i think is that as as you're entering through the story or through the drama that as you get to the point where it starts to look like someone could win you are leaving the second act even if that person doesn't win uh, or, or they're upset and someone, uh, you know, upset by their plans and someone else wins. That point in the drama or the story or the, the, the three-act structure, you are uh, uh, leaving the second act is what sets up the third act. And um, the th- a story's third act is all about the conclusion. It's all about the resolution. It's all about where the, the, the story... And the, and the rules and the mechanics come together to finish the game. Elements of their most intense competition is their most intense. Everything has to be resolved. Then some um, action will be triggered. 
uh, and then that will result in the scores being tallied or the results being announced. The third act is typically the shortest in length. For many people, it's the most important, not for me personally, but you know, many people are just there to see who wins and that's okay. Um, uh, I just got another quote from Tidball here. So uh, the second act transitions to the third act at the point where it becomes clear to the savvy player that one player has achieved a clear upper hand and barring a reversal of some kind, that player is going to win. The accompanying emotional alarm or euphoria, depending, is the key to the third act. All of the players know that the end is near and that they've either got to take one last stab at unseating the leader or they've just got to hang in there for a little while longer to secure the triumph. A key feature of an emotionally satisfying third act though, is that the front runner's victory must not be inevitable. If it is inevitable, the whole third act is an unnecessary mechanical exercise. For a designer or publisher, a seemingly endless endgame is even more terrible than it might appear, because its actual tedium is magnified in the player's minds, not because their experience of the game, uh, minds because their experience of the game ended on that note. So, what this is saying is that the third act shouldn't be too short. Like it shouldn't just be, oh, the, the, the person's just done that thing and they've won. You must be able to see it coming. And it shouldn't be too long. It shouldn't drag on forever in, in, in <clears throat> excuse me, an endless series of reversals. Oh, I think we got through that. Yeah. It's very early. I apologize for not really commenting that much, but this is like generally pretty much completely spot on. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> like, uh, this is something to know for your own designs. Um, there are lots of games out there which have kind of crap ends. Yeah. 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 Uh, Sheriff of Nottingham's another one. Sheriff Ooh, of Nottingham's yeah. a great game. The middle of Sheriff of Nottingham is tense as hell. Yeah. I have felt ill playing Sheriff of Nottingham. I've been so excited. But the ending of Sheriff of Nottingham is all right, we're going to do a bit of bookkeeping and uh, I've oh tony won cool <laughs> um, yeah 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 oh that was it okay yeah and and it and it's okay especially when you're starting out especially with early designs for your designs to not have amazing ends like they describe euphoria like you might not have a euphoria but you know just think in terms of this structure and it will help you recognize what elements of your design you can expand on Thank you, Richard. That's really well said. And that's a perfect place to end on. Uh, I've got a new end title slide uh, with my, my unicorn icon and um, the idea that as you go through this course, that the best thing you can do to learn is to play more games. Thank you, Richard. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you all students for your attention. Bye. Bye.